Today we explore relationology with Mark Bird. I believe that relationships are the true currency of business. He turned his dyslexic difference into a superpower, rising from remedial English to best-selling author. Hear how he recommends. Start relationships. Stop short-term transactional interactions with people and build uh, long-term, high-trust, authentic relationships. Tune in as he reveals how to grow your business or build a career through the power of meaningful relationships. Like the video and subscribe to the channel for more from Wealth Chronicles. Matt Bird, welcome to Wealth Chronicles. It's great to be here, Michael. Matt, I've known you over the years as a relationship expert, among many other things that you do. You have authored over 20 books, spoken to thousands of people. But where I want to really start today is to start in your primitive years and understand where your journey really begins. Right back at school, in the playground, in the classroom, were you a man who was, or rather a boy who had many friends and many connections, or is it something that you learned along the way? Well, Michael, that's a great question. I remember growing up in a home where I wasn't allowed to have friends home. In fact, I actually was. I can remember on one occasion being allowed my friend Peter over. And uh, that was the only time I remember having a friend over. There may be other occasions, but that's the one I remember. I remember growing up in a home that was a relationally impoverished, I would say. Um, I remember my father reaching for the remote control on the television and putting it on mute whenever the front door uh, bell rang and ushering my mum, my sister and I to hide behind the sofa and pretend nobody was home. So I, I grew up in relational poverty, I would say, looking back on it now. So I didn't grow up in an environment of confidence around people uh, and confidence about relationships. So that, those are my beginnings. So at school, how did that play out in the fact that you were not allowed to engage with so many friends within the household? How did that translate within your, your school? Yeah, and it played out in school. I, I, you know, I, I had one or two friends, but I was, I've always felt slightly on the edge. And that was also because in terms of education, I really struggled. I struggled to read. I struggled to write. I struggled to spell. Um, and as you're listening to this, you probably think, ah, I know, but I didn't know at the time. Okay. Um, I, had, yeah, I, I, I had no idea what dyslexia was, never heard the word. But at school, all I knew is I found it really difficult. And like most people with dyslexia, uh, you know, you often feel on the outside at school, you often struggle with your self-esteem, self-worth, self-belief. So actually, I was not a confident person. I wasn't relationally confident. My, my teachers uh, put me in remedial English classes, um, which was, you know, a real affirmation, you know, to be a remedial kid, um, <laughs> you know, about your ability. So those are the things, some of the things I remember about, about home and school, home, hiding behind the sofa when the doorbell rang mm. and school, my resounding memory was being put in remedial English classes and how that made me feel. I wasn't allowed to be, do computer studies because my grasp of the English language wasn't good enough. And I left school believing I was stupid because that's what my teachers made me feel about myself. I mean, you wouldn't believe it because you're so eloquent. When I hear you speak, it seems like you really has grasped the, the English language and you can articulate yourself very well. So while you were at school uh, and you were somewhat behind in your classes or finding it difficult to mm. learn and to, let's say, even pronounce certain words, yeah. you are. I would still struggle with some of them. <laughs> <laughs> how, did you, how did that impact you um, in school in terms of building relationship or even getting teased at? Because that's tends to be the... the, the yeah, I got, I got picked on at school. I had one friend called Jason. Yeah. Uh, if you're listening, please reach out. <laughs> we lost contact a long time ago. But I remember Jason at school. Um, and uh, it, was, it was just a very tough time. I think the most important thing I learned at school mm. um, was business. But I didn't learn business in the classroom. I remember my family, we weren't poor, but we weren't, we weren't, we weren't flush. Okay. And I remember taking my pat lunch to school, opening it up and always being disappointed. You know, there was a sandwich, uh, there was an apple, always an apple. But unlike the other kids, I never had a bag of crisps. My mum felt it was too much money, too extravagant. Um, so we got a sandwich and an apple. I never had a bag of crisps. And I always felt slightly resentful about that. 
But my father actually worked for a big business, and one of their lines was confectionery. So in the staff shop, he used to buy really cheap um, boxes of chocolate bars. And uh, we always got a chocolate bar in our pat lunch. No bag of crisps. We always got a chocolate bar. And I remember one day, uh, Barney, the most popular boy in my class, saying to me, Matt, I'll buy that off you. And I was like, okay. And he made an offer and I accepted the offer. Um, and he loved it. He said, can you bring a couple more tomorrow? So uh, on the way to school, I just snuck in the kitchen, got an extra bar out of the, out of the cupboard, put it in my packed lunch. And I, the following day, <clears throat> Barney bought two bars from me. Now, the good thing about Barney is Barney was the most popular kid in my class. What Barney did so it wasn't long before I was actually putting the whole box of chocolates in my sports bag, taking them to school, selling them in five minutes at a break. And uh, I had to explain to my mum and dad what I was doing and said, Dad, you know, can you go into the staff shop every day rather than once a week? And here's the money. Can you buy more boxes of chocolate bars? And that's what he started doing. I think, I think the people who worked in the staff shop must have thought he's, my dad's kids were obese. The amount of chocolate that he bought. But, you know, I was making more money in one day than the rest of the kids were making all week doing a paper round at 5 a.m. every morning. I didn't want to get up. I mean, English weather, rain, snow, ice, you know, you don't want to be up at that time of the day kind of on a bike delivering papers. And, you know, and I'd earn more in one day than they earned the whole week. So this is when I first learned business. And I didn't realize at the time what I was learning. But these were the beginnings of my entrepreneurial spirit coming out. Circling back to building meaningful connections and relationships, what were some of the key lessons you learned in that trade because you're having to build relationships with different people and retaining the customers over a certain period of time? I had no idea what I was doing, Michael. I mean, <laughs> I mean looking back, it was just, it was just opportunistic. Okay. I think the key for me is that Barney was the most popular boy in class and people like popularity and they follow popularity. You know, and today I have a number of ventures and I get celebrity involvement in some of them, you know, because actually having some association from people who others want to follow helps grow what you're doing. So, you know, so I, I did certainly learn that, but it wasn't any more sophisticated than that. It was pure opportunity. And, you know, looking back now, I was making a 70% margin on every uh, chocolate bar sold, you know, so happy days. I mean, we now live in the age of influencer marketing where brands really try to associate themselves with an individual like Bunny. So <laughs> from your point, how do you see that in terms of the new kind of way of marketing that businesses have to potentially consider and, you know, the character of Bunny? Yeah, I mean, I run a global foundation. We work in a dozen countries, um, empowering community groups to uh, help people experiencing vulnerability, isolation, and injustice. And we have a number of global ambassadors. You know, I, 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 I kind of uh, uh, develop partnerships with young musicians, you know, who have profile, who have platform, and work with them to raise the profile of what our global foundation does. I mean, that'd be a great example of getting some celebrity endorsement. You know, I, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I've authored 20 books, but for me, much more significant than the books I've authored is the books I now help other people write. I coach over 100 pe people a year to write, publish, and launch their books. And so part of what we're doing is helping each of those authors become famous. And how do we make them and their books better known? So, yeah, it, a lot of it is kind of relationship marketing and uh, helping them build a loyal community of followers and, and building that out, you know. So going back to your first venture, mm. walk us through where you developed from there as a business person to then develop the concept of relationology, which has taken you around the world, got you to speak to many corporate companies and trade thousands of people. Yeah, I would never have thought it, you know, from working with the Federal Reserve Bank in the USA to the big four professional service firms here in the UK and in other parts of the world. It's, it's surprising. And it all stemmed from an invitation I received to speak at a business conference on the subject of, wait for it, networking. <laughs> now, I love speaking, so whenever I get an invitation to speak, I'm there. But I actually hate networking. And so I found... Oh, no. 
Well, I phoned the organiser of the conference to explain why I hated networking. And I said, look, I, I just find networking contrived, manipulative, disingenuous, self-serving, selfish, transactional, short-term. Yeah, I could go on and on and on. Uh, the guy was a little bit taken aback. I said, he said, but Matt, you're really into relationships. I said, I am into relationships, but I'm into building authentic, high trust, long-term relationships. And so he said to me, well, why don't you come and speak on that subject? I agreed. Didn't want to become known as the anti-networking guy. It's always bad to be defined by what you're not. Mm. Um, so I thought, what, what is this? What is this fascination and passion and interest I have in human interaction? And I thought, well, relationships are a science because we all can, we can all learn to do them better. They're an art form because they take a lifetime to master. So I was thinking about the art and the science and the study of relationships. And I thought, relationology, mm -hmm. the study of relationships. So I ran to my computer, Googled it, uh, formed the company, trademarked the name, bought the web domain, and the rest is history. <clears throat> and I've built a whole body of, uh, of knowledge based upon what works. It's not theoretical. It's based on praxis um, around the importance and significance of building authentic relationships you know, in the workplace to grow and develop your venture, whatever it might be. Okay, so Matt, what are you suggesting here then? Are you saying that we are not to go to networking events and engage people? Because that's the standard way that everyone has been taught. And that's the most available, easiest way of, you know, picking up as many business cards as possible. Yeah, but we've all been to those events, haven't we? And we're still talking to somebody. Yes. And we think they're interested in us. And then we realize they're just trying to find out if we could be useful to them or not. And the minute they think we're not, they're off. Oh, we're still talking to somebody. Right. And we all get distracted, don't we, in a busy room. But they're constantly looking over our shoulder to see if somebody more important has walked into the room you know so do I, do I go to events I do go to events but I don't go to network I go to build relationships so my method my message is stop networking start relationships stop short term um, uh, transactional um, interactions with people and build uh, long term high trust authentic relationships you know, and this is with everybody from your suppliers that enable your business to do what it does to your employees and contractors through to your, your customers and your clients. The strength of those relationships is what makes the business work. Okay, so what is Matt Bird doing in a room full of individuals that's different to the average person who is just going there and collecting as many cards as possible? <laughs> I'm looking... Often in an event like that, I'm looking for one profound connection. Okay. And so my expectation going into it isn't to collect two dozen business cards <clears throat> because people who do that never do anything with them anyway or rarely do anything with them. Actually, um, it's much better to go uh, with a hope and an expectation um, to actually interact with somebody you have a profound connection with and that that connection sustains over time and there'll be moments in that connection when you'll do things together and you'll transact. Uh, but it's not based upon a transactionality. There's actually a, a chemistry and a connection between you as people, as human beings. So are you canvassing the room? Because to make a connection, sometimes you actually have to canvass the room to find maybe some similarities, or are you <laughs> researching prior? What, what are you doing? I'm trying to really understand, Matt. Yeah, well, you... What am I doing wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, how a person looks mm. can be deceiving. Okay. Um, and I've learned that over the years. You know, sometimes the people who look the smartest are actually the con merchants. And the people who look the most, most relaxed are actually the most genuine people. Mm. So, but it's not always like that. So you can't always read a person uh, by the way they look. Some of the wealthiest people I know, you know, you would never know from the way they present themselves. Very humble. And some of the, some of the people are struggling the most, are the best dressed. Uh, you know, so actually it's hard, you know, it's hard to know. You, 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 I just go to an event and I kind of like, kind of pray and just say, look, I just want, I'll, I'm happy to chat with whoever, 
but I'm kind of, I'm open. I just want the universe to know I'm open to connecting with somebody, you know, and uh, it doesn't always happen. Sometimes I actually walk away with two profound connections, even yeah. better. So it's really about your 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 focus as you go to an event okay. like that. Is it just lots of business cards you want that you do nothing with? Um, or even get loads of business cards and type them into LinkedIn afterwards, you know, but still nothing happens. Um, or are you looking for one or two um, deeper connections with people who you'll actually follow through with afterwards and say, hey, let's meet for a coffee or let's jump on Zoom and have an online coffee together. You know, that's actually what is really beneficial. So it's, you know, so how do you make it happen? Yeah, it's a bit of serendipity, okay. you know. I mean, obviously you can choose where you go. <laughs> you know, if you want to, if you want to find an accountant, go to an event that accountants are at. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to meet a, um, a videographer, go to an event where you might meet some videographers. Yeah, you, you you can actually target the sorts of events where you might meet the sort of people you want to meet. But but beyond that, it's it's serendipity. Are you ready to unlock the secrets to generational wealth? Introducing principles for creating generational wealth, a blueprint to building a lasting legacy. In this empowering book, you'll discover proven strategies and expert insights to create a financial legacy that lasts for generations to come. Learn how to build a solid foundation for your family's future, make wise investments, and harness the power of generational wealth. Don't miss this life-changing opportunity. Download your free copy now at cityestatepartners.com wealth or simply click the link in the video bio. Let's talk about the part of building meaningful connections beyond the first meeting. I've yeah. gone to this event. I've made a connection. What, what am I expected to do in terms of really nurturing that relationship in a way that is not transactional, where I am at the forefront pitching, stating my offer so that we yeah. can either do business, engage. What, what are we supposed to do from that point onward? Sure. So you've met somebody at an event. Um, you know, I'll always drop them a note within 24 hours, whether it's an email, a message on LinkedIn, a WhatsApp, you know, we all have our own communication preferences. Um, but I, I'll, I'll drop them a note and say, it'd be great for, to meet for a coffee sometime, you know, wherever that might be, depending where they, they're based. And sometimes you don't hear anything else from them, and that's fine. Other times, I say, yes, do that. And you'll schedule something for the following month or a couple of weeks later and meet for a coffee. And just take time to get to know them, you know, and uh, and understand their world. And there might be an immediate connection. I mean, I meet people, they might say, oh, my goodness, I've wanted to write a book all my life. And, and you run a course to, I'm signing up for the next course. Sometimes that happens. Other times, nothing at all. So as people say, oh, I always wanted to go on holiday in Sicily. I'd love to rent you a holiday home. You know, great, but, you know, I'm, I'm not pitching that. As you tell your story, people, people, it's much better to buy than be sold to. You know, you don't need to pitch. Just, just tell your story. If people want what you have to offer, they'll ask you. So, you know, so, you know, meet for a coffee, um, you know, and then you might actually say, oh, actually, why don't we do this together? Why don't we, why don't we go and play golf or why don't we go and play, have a meal or why don't I introduce you to so-and-so or I'm going to this event, would you like to be my guest? Just look for another connection point. So it's just, it's, it's, it's very natural, very organic, very authentic, not contrived, um, and just go with the energy, go with the flow. One of the most important things in investment for my world, it's about understanding an investment horizon of, uh, of an investment you make, whether it be into a project or even in a relationship. And what you'll find is that a lot of people are so short-term sighted that they're looking for that return within the next month or so. Can you give us some examples of, you know, uh, relationships where you've had great, you know, sort of like horizon in terms of from the first time you met and potentially nothing happened for a good number of years and ultimately, you know, it brought forth fruit later on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember uh, reading an interview in one of the London papers of the incoming chief executive of um, one of the high street banks. And there, I also read the article. There was a, there was a point of connection that, that we had, a, a shared interest. And I wrote to him and said, congratulations on your appointment. Um, da -da, da -da, da -da. I noticed that. I am also da-da-da-da. And just wrote to him and said, can I take you out for a drink? 
got a letter back saying, yeah, we'd love to. You know, and I met him then. We we did something together. But, but years, years later, now his family uh, office makes a, a multi-year grant to my global foundation. You know, that's not why I formed the relationship. But there's been many other things over the years that have happened. But but that is that, that was over a, that was that was nearly twenty years ago. I first formed that relationship, and it's only the last fifteen that that's happened. But if I hadn't initially formed the relationship, it didn't create the possibility of that happening. You know, so so all along dealing with dyslexia in the background, <laughs> managing relationships. Tell me, how are you writing twenty books? Because that's an oxymoron there. <laughs> For someone who is having issues of, you know, structuring sentences or dealing with complex words, yeah. uh, you had to go and do extra classes in English, and now you are potentially writing more books than your than your tutors ever did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I say my teachers told me I was stupid and I left school believing I was stupid because because of the way they made me feel. Uh, there was one teacher, my English teacher, Mr. Alul. And uh, he was amazing. He he encouraged me, gave me extra support. You know, and I managed to get a um, you know a qualification in English thanks to thanks to him. So I just want to credit him. But but how did I come to write books? Well, it wasn't until I was in my twenties that somebody said to me, "Matt, you're dyslexic." And I said, "What's dyslexia?" <laughs> you know. And so over the years, my understanding has increased. You know, dyslexia isn't about your level of intelligence. Uh, quite, quite, quite the opposite. You know, uh, dyslexics can be some of the most intelligent people. Um, it's actually about how you learn, how you process information. So I violently object to dyslexia being called a learning disability, disorder, or difficulty. It's not a disability. People with dyslexia can be very able. It's not a disorder. There's nothing wrong with us. It's not a, a, a difficulty. Uh, we just learn differently. And so I advocate that dyslexia should not be called a disability disorder or difficulty. It should be called a difference. But the problem is uh, the educational system uh, has been created by people who are not dyslexic for people who are not dyslexic. And they think that the only measure of being clever is to read and regurgitate in an essay and exam uh, environments. And if you can do that, you're clever. And if you can do that, I think you are really clever. But it is ignorant in the highest order to think that is the only way to measure intelligence. And I even find it offensive that people say, oh, academic and non-academic, as if not, uh, the, the, the inference is non-academic is not as good as academic. Mm. It's absolute nonsense and it offends me. And so I'm advocating as a dyslexia ambassador for a, a change in the way we think and speak. Um, about dyslexia. So, come back to your question. I discovered in my in my twenties that I was dyslexic, and it helped me understand some of the reasons why I struggled so much at school. Mm. Um, but I remember sitting with a friend, you know, like this, not in front of a camera, uh, one day, and he said to me, "Matt, you've got a book in you." He said, "Yeah." Um, I was talking to him about some speeches I was giving at a conference, and he said, "Those speeches, they're a book." Mm. And he picked up the telephone, dialed his publisher and said, oh, I've got a young man here. It was a few years ago. I've got a young man here who's got a book in him. Will you publish it? And he passed me the phone. I nearly went my <laughs> Um And that's how I came to publish my first book. And my first book was really difficult. It was, you know, because I do struggle to spell string sentences together, you know, let alone a long form book. Yeah. But, but I learned some technique and some methods that helped me get through that first book. Yeah, you know, when you've done one, I thought, oh, I felt amazing. But I thought, it was a fluke. Mm. So I thought, I know, I'll do a second one. I bet you I can't do a second one. So I did a second book. I thought, maybe I can. And then a third one, I think, actually, it's not so difficult after all. And every book I wrote, I was learning new techniques, new methods for me as uh, with my... Ugh, approach to learning to actually produce a book. So yeah, I've, I've gone on to author 20 books and continue to author Incredible. books. <laughs> but now I use all those techniques that I learned to help other people. And whilst they may not be dyslexic, everybody comes to the thought of writing a book with obstacles in their lives. And I think your story is a testament of how you can overcome any obstacles 
yeah. um, and actually go on to to write your your you know your own book. Uh, there's a perspective you had in one of your articles that you wrote about dyslexia being your superpower. <laughs> Talk more about that. How, you know that perspective is very powerful. I think for oneself who mm. has dyslexia. Yeah, I mean a, a, a few things. One is um, there's a disproportionate number of entrepreneurs who identify as dyslexic. In the U.S. population, 15% of people identify as dyslexic. Amongst U.S. Uh, company founders, entrepreneurs, 35% that's identify that's up on 35. That's a big number. as dyslexic mm-hmm. compared to 15 in the general population. Here, the NHS in the U.K. says that 10% of the population um, uh, identifies dyslexic. Uh, uh, there, I haven't found a figure on the number of entrepreneurs that are, but there is there is certainly a dis proportionate number of entrepreneurs um, who are dyslexic or uh, neurodivergent. And that is because um, one of the things that comes with dyslexia is the ability to problem solve, to make connections between people and places and products, to, to see things other people don't see. We see the big picture. So I call it my superpower because actually I believe I'm very entrepreneurial. I start lots of things from scratch. I love starting things from scratch and building them up. Um, and that's that's because of my dyslexia superpower. The other thing about dyslexia is uh, the company behind Post-it Notes. They say that thinking visually is 60,000 times faster than thinking with words. Now, one of the differences often um, contrasted between people with dyslexia and without dyslexia is people with dyslexia think in pictures. Uh, and people without dyslexia tend to think in work. So if that's the case, dyslexics are some of the fastest thinkers because we think visually. And these are just two reasons why I believe actually dyslexia is my superpower. So I no longer, I used to think I suffered with dyslexia. I didn't suffer. The system caused me, caused me to suffer because it tried to push me through its sausage machine. But now I'm free of that system it's like getting a bird to to sweep. <laughs> yeah, it will think it's absolutely. And so now, you know, I embrace my dyslexia. Mm. Yeah, I, I I struggle to read a whole book or remember anything it said. I struggle to spell, but I have people around me who can spell and who read books from cover to cover. Do you know what I mean? I, yeah, you don't have to be good at everything, but I know what I'm good at, and so I lean into my entrepreneurial um, spirit. I lean into my visual a way of gathering information, processing information. I'm embracing fully who I am. It's a big talk around diversity within workplaces. Um, most big companies will have a chief diversity officer. Uh, it's, a, it's a word that is being bedded about. As I was reading some of your work, I came across neurodiversity within the workplace. Mm. Can, you, can you explain what that means and how it can actually be implemented? Yeah, I mean, it's such a huge subject, um, you know, and for for years, businesses have been talking about diversity uh, and that there have often been businesses that are a whitewash. I mean, in terms of ethnic diversity, you know, the research says that, you know, most um, C-suite uh, leaders, you know, in the FTSE 100 are white, you know, and there's there's metrics you can track and how that's changing. And so people have been championing correctly and rightly um, ethnic diversity, also gender diversity. Uh, the, the executives and boards are not just a whitewash, they're, they're, they're male dominant. So we also need greater um, gender diversity. But actually, alongside, uh, there are other strands of diversity. Alongside that is also what I call cognitive diversity. We need to think differently. We need people on leadership teams and executives and boards who bring a different perspective and this is the value and the power of neurodiversity. <clears throat> and organisations like GCHQ, um, the UK's you know, Information Gathering, uh, Secret Service, uh, NASA in the US, Google, some of these companies have been very proactive in actually trying to recruit people with dyslexia because they recognise they bring a different way of thinking and a different way of processing uh, information. And, and it's still slow, but there is a greater appreciation of diversity. Most, I mean, I do a lot of work with the big four professional services firms. You know, they have, they, they use language like, bring your whole self to work. If you have a faith, bring it to work. Don't leave it at the door. 
you know, if, if, if you are, you know, um, neurodivergent, don't try and leave it at all. Don't pretend you can spell and write reports if you really struggle with that. Bring it to work. Bring your ethnicity to work. Bring your gender to work. You know, this place is no longer monochrome men in suits, white men in suits. Actually, we want to engage the diversity of humanity in our people and in our organisations, because that brings with it greater engagement, greater discretionary effort, greater innovation, greater problem solving skills, because we don't all think the same and have the same perspective on life. Incredible, wonderful perspective on relationology, uh, as well as dyslexia, neurodiversity, new term for you out there to, to look into. And I'm sure there will be a chief neurodiversity officer something <laughs> if you keep pushing this message forward. Yeah, because the truth is, Michael, the truth is it's, it's easier to build relationships with people like you than people unlike you. But if you only build relationships with people like you, you only have access to the ideas, opportunities and resources that people like you have. And that's, that, that's dangerous when it comes to social mobility. Actually, we all need to be able to build relationships with people l unlike us. It's harder, it's more difficult, it's more challenging, it's more uncomfortable, but we need those relationships because they give us access to ideas, opportunities and resources we wouldn't have otherwise. So this is absolutely fundamentally important to the future of the workplace. Relationship gold from Mark Baird. Let's continue this conversation. A credible concept of relationology uh, and from a philosophical and uh, point of view, it's, you know, it's a great piece to talk about. How does it translate into actual hard money in the bank? Because as a leader of a business, I get a little off, you know, philosophers and people with different concepts um, mm. about building relationships or, or some kind of new theory or thesis that has come out of a university. And they're sending me a product and I, all I'm concerned about is, okay, how does this translate into adding real tangible value, i.e. I'm able to pay my stuff more. We are able to see a real result that drives us forward because as we now live in the world of entrepreneurs where people are either self-employed to some extent, how do we take this concept and implement it and actually up impact our bottom lines? I believe that relationships are the true currency of business. If you're obsessed about money, you'll always struggle to make it. If you become obsessed about relationships, the money will flow. I first discovered this. Um, I had a fascination for biographies and autobiographies. I have shelves of these. Political leaders, business leaders, you know, celebrities, sports personalities, people that have done kind of uh, perceivably incredible things with their lives. Most people do, but these people are, you know, are the ones that get the biographies and autobiographies written. As I read them, I noticed something. I noticed that, uh, what some people call, uh, I, I noticed the signs and evidence of how they discovered success. And for every single one of these people, although they didn't always say it in their biography, autobiography, it was about the relationships that they formed. Saw so that, you know, Richard Branson, who formed that relationship with Freddie Laker, you know, when you launch Virgin uh, Airways, that relate and taking on British Airways, you know, I don't want to go into all that, but that relationship was critical for him, um, you know, in his business venture. Some politicians, when he saw the people that their parents brought into the home that they were able to build relationships with, which enabled them to uh, get where they got to politically, it was all about relationships. And if you ask anybody who's experienced particular success uh, in their arena, what part of relationships played in getting you to where you've got to, they will all say absolutely the most important thing. And so I just want to say to anybody listening that relationships are the true currency of business. They're the true currency of politics. They're the true currency of whatever world you're in, the true currency of media, whatever world or sector you're in, relationships are absolutely fundamental. So why are they so important? People do business, people do deals, people work with uh, the people they like, know and trust. The last thing you do when you're engaging an accountant is Google online, give me an accountant, see who comes up, phone them and engage them. No. 
you don't engage suppliers like that. You engage suppliers by saying, well, who have I used before that did a good job? And if you haven't used a particular supplier before, you ask who? Someone you know, like and trust, a friend, mm. a colleague. Can you recommend a good accountant or whatever the service might be? And so actually growing your business is all based upon relationships. You know, the most, it doesn't matter how much money you spend on advertising or any other sort of marketing, the most powerful form of advertising and marketing is word of mouth. It always has been, it always will be. It's what others say about you. Because actually using somebody randomly that you have no reference for is high risk. So we all go to people. If we don't know them already, we ask people we do know to recommend somebody to us. Because this is how business works. This is how media works. This is how politics works. Okay, so you're entering into a small SME. What are you saying to the team that is spending a lot of money on Google Ads? They have a lot of drive on picking up the phone and KPIs about how many calls, the conversion. What type of repositioning are you suggesting that they do? Oh, carry on doing exactly what you're doing. Okay. But build relationships along the way. You know, we live in a, in a high-tech world. It's phenomenal what you can do. Um, but also, we, because we live in such a high-tech world, we also need high-touch we still need human interaction. And it doesn't matter how much you can jump on video calls. You cannot escape the fact that an interpersonal, in-person interaction is 10 times, 20 times more impactful than jumping on a video call. Speaking live at a conference, as I often do, to 1,000, 10,000, 50,000 people is, is, is so much more impactful than getting them all on a video call. It just is. Human interaction always has been and always will be very significant, no matter how uh, technology makes the world easier for us. We will always need high touch. We will always need human interaction. There's no escaping. So how do we scale? Now we're talking about we've understood the concept of creating meaningful relationships. How can you scale it? from a business perspective in terms of how do you scale the number of touch points you have utilizing technology, not, 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 not working against or it being on the other side of the spectrum, uh, especially in the world of content, content creation, being influencers and putting out touch points out there. How can we scale relationships? Well, the, the truth is you can't have the sort of relationship we're talking about with everybody you know. You can't have an interpersonal relationship with everybody you know digitally. It's not possible. You know, I have tens and tens of thousands of people like you do mm. who interact with me um, on social media. I can't meet them all for a coffee. So you have to you know, differentiate your relationships, I call it, because you can't have the same relationship with everybody you know. Otherwise, you would, you would kill yourself. <laughs> and there are plenty of, plenty of people who do burn out mm. trying to be everything to everyone. But you need to be able to say, actually, um, you know, I, I need to um, make myself, you know, fully available digitally. But when it comes to in-person contact, I need to have a system and a way of structuring that so I don't kill myself. <laughs> um, so that's really important. You know, um, I often talk about, you know, your soulmates, less than, less than five people probably in each of our lives you know, who we share our whole life with. Um, we haven't got the emotional energy to do more than that. And some people sadly don't have anybody. And that becomes very difficult for them. And then we have what I call my, your speed dial relationships. <laughs> you know, these are the 50 people that you can put on your speed dial on your phone. These are the people you talk to once a month or message once a month and are in regular contact with. They make your world go round. Family, colleagues, um, people from clubs and sports clubs and they're just people you do life with and there's probably a you know uh, probably a list of 150 beyond that um, and a list of 500 beyond that and then thousands beyond that so I talk about creating a relational ecosystem I mean this is what businesses do British Airways I, I love I, I travel a lot I travel a lot with BA they have a very smart system and it's a very upfront out there system you know, you, you, you fly with BA, you're blue, you become bronze, silver, gold, and beyond. And depending on how much money you spend, how often you fly, 
depends on what level of you have in their community because they you know they value some people would argue differently but you know business should value all its customers but some are particularly significant for it and so you develop loyalty and you have a deeper relationship with those people same in non-profit and charity you know 80 percent of your income probably comes from 20 percent of your um, foundations relationships contracts so yeah you want to value all your revenue but actually the 80 percent of your revenue that comes from 20 percent of your donors and contractors you, you need to make a bit more effort with them <laughs> to have a personal relationship so whether you work in the non-profit space or the for-profit space actually it's critical to differentiate your relationships and say actually i can't have the same relationship with everybody and i i know and it's not wrong to not have the same relationship with everybody you know as long as you you know, are open to people and that makes sense no it certainly does so we're in a high-tech world we need high touch but you need to recognize that there are two different ways of engaging with the market one of the key focus of this show is about encouraging individuals to be intentional about creating generational wealth. Then this doesn't just mean monetary. Uh, this means uh, so many things to so many people. So to a person who is very intentional about building generational wealth and building a legacy for their lineage, what does that translate and look like in terms of implementation? Uh, especially also using the canvas of your own personal story and your own children. What are the bad kids learning about building relationships? Are they, is the strategy to put them in private school so that they grow up with certain type of people and they build those connections? Because that's, you know, if we all look at our, even our politics or our businesses, there is a tendency that you find, oh, they went to the same school. <laughs> you know, yeah. is this part of the strategy that some of the great families have implemented? What does that look like? when I'm intentional about generational wealth and at what age are we starting yeah. to impart some of these truths? Yeah, because actually, um, you know, financial wealth is one aspect of it, but social mm. relational wealth is even more valuable because you're going to lose all your money, but you can make it again. But actually, relationships are, thing, are, 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 are assets as well. And so in my book, Relationology, I talk about collecting relationships keeping relationships and growing relationships, recognizing that they are the most valuable asset you have in life. And they're an appreciating asset. Many of the things we buy, the toys we buy are depreciating assets, but relationships become more valuable over time. And so actually something that you can give your children is relationships. The people you have to your home, the people they meet, I mean, my eldest son is doing cyber security. You know, I, I know over a hundred people working in cyber security. He could get a placement anywhere in the world in any business he wanted to because of those relationships. And that, that these are just people that offer say, oh, if he needs to do a year out or wants a placement, you know, talk to me, we'll do it. Actually, the relationships that a parent creates, there are ways of uh, creating opportunities for your children. Uh, in that, and, and, that, and they then take on those relationships. Uh, I think it's really important to recognise that wealth comes in many forms. Financial wealth is significant, but relational wealth, I, I would argue, is even more significant because with the right relationships, you can start again tomorrow and build up financial wealth again. But if you lose all your relationships, yes, you can rebuild, but it takes a long time. So what relationship etiquette are you teaching, you know, some of the young birds? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm teaching them the principles of authenticity. Be real in your relationships. Yeah, be your true self. Don't treat people differently because they th you think they might be able to do more for you. Just treat everybody well. That's really important, whoever they are. And that's, yeah, I mean, you might think, well, of course you do, but mm. you see how some people behave in the business world. Sure. No. Uh, the second thing I, I want to pass on to my kids is you have to be intentional and deliberate about relationships. Relationships are too important to leap to chance. We actually need to be proactive and deliberate about um, building our relationships and, and having a relationship strategy. What is your commitment to building relationships with the people you know? So you have uh, three kids? Yes. 
What are the ages? Uh, 14, 16, and 19. Okay, so now they are at the precipice of trying to get into the world of work. So to a young person who doesn't have the fortune of having your parents who has built this relationship so that they can step into the world of work uh, by their parent opening the doors. Yeah. What advice can you give them? They are staring at a world that doesn't have the employment that they were promised yeah. while going through education and paying all the, the fees to go to a university. Yeah. They get the degree. The jobs are not available. 50% is says that the jobs are being given out without being advertised because they are going through potentially relationships. Yeah. What, did that, what does that young person do in terms of a relationship building action plan yeah. for my bed to help them get yeah. into, the, into the place of work? Well, you do what you did and what I did. We started from scratch, but recognizing actually that the relations, there are relationships around you already that are significant. You just don't know it yet. And that's the importance of treating everybody with great value and worth and respect. I remember uh, when I was at school, um, as well as selling chocolates at break, I used to wash cars in the evenings uh, for neighbours. And uh, one of the guys I washed his car every week, he said to me one time, he said, what are you going to do when you leave school? I said, I don't know, John. He said, uh, well, I might have something for you. So next time I went, he gave me the application form for a job. And I applied, and he helped me fill in the application form. Um, when I got invited for interview, he sat with me and did interview preparation with me. Um, when I got the job, yeah, he, he became a sponsor and looked out for me. I had no idea that was going to happen. And so I'd say to people, actually, there are people around you already, and you don't know how they can help you. And you don't know who it is that's going to help you. So make sure you damn well treat all of them really well, because you never know where the opportunity is coming from. So I would say to you, just be proactive about building relationships. And secondly, is get out there and meet people. Mm. Don't spend every evening on Netflix on the sofa. You know, get out there. You know, too many people will sit around mm. waiting for the opportunities to come to them. Go out there, build the relationships. If you build the relationships, the opportunities will come. And I've always said, if the door of opportunity isn't knocking, well, the answer isn't to give up. The, the, the answer is to make a door. Mm. Create your own door, create your own opportunity, create your own moment. Uh, but you can only do that if you've got the relationships. As we look ahead and the age of AI is at our doorstep, <laughs> yep. uh, which is literally going to change industries, how we do business, the jobs that will be available, the jobs that will be created, what changes, what shifts should we be making in our thinking of building relationship? How do we leverage rather than look at it as a detriment to mm. authenticity of building relationship? Yeah, the thing is in every generation there is new technology, a technological advance, and some people feel threatened by it because they think, oh, it could replace me or replace what I do. We'll never replace you, but it might replace what you do. Um, and so, you know, the answer isn't to run away from it and to fight it. The answer is actually to embrace it and see how you can use it. Um, I mean, for example, with my publishing company, Publish You, we now create audio books using AI. You no longer need to book a studio, um, an editor, um, and practice your voice and hope you don't have a cold or an infection that week uh, and, and, and invest all of that in going and re recording your audio for your book. Record your voice for two minutes simulate your voice and create a whole audio book. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. You know, a, a week-long job is done in 10 minutes, you know, with somebody else doing all the back end. So it's, it's amazing what you can do with AI. But let's not be afraid of it. Let's lean into it and see how we can use it uh, for our advantage. Um, and yes, we need to ask some ethical questions um, because actually the world is made up of people, not machines. So let's ask, you know, what is the impact upon what we're doing um, on people? And that's not to say we shouldn't do it, but we just need to be conscious about how it affects the people around us. Relationology by Mark Baird is available in the link below. You do not want to miss this Relationship Gold uh, book that helps you build relationship, authentic relationship that will upscale your company, your business and your life. Check it out. Relationology in the link below.